In my last video, I talked about the Vanishing Hitchhiker legend, and one of the sources that I used for that video was this book, The Vanishing Hitchhiker, American Urban Legends and Their Meanings by Jan Harold Brunvard. It's a bit of an older book published in the 1980s, so before the social media age, but as I was reading it, I realized some of the urban legends described in the book have a lot in common with misinformation and disinformation online. So in this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to fact check the stories that you hear, whether they're on social media or whether you hear them through word of mouth like an old-fashioned urban legend. Take, for example, the story of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel's red velvet cake. Red velvet cake is a very common dessert food in the United States today, and you can find dozens if not hundreds of recipes online for free just by googling. However, the story goes that it originated from the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and that their recipe was, for a long time, a complete secret. Eventually, a woman liked it so much that she wrote to the hotel asking for the recipe and they sent it to her, along with a bill for $350. She asked her lawyer if she had to pay it and the lawyer said yes, so she did. But to get revenge, she shared the recipe as widely as possible for free. The only problem is, none of that actually happened. In fact, the idea of a velvet cake dates back to the Victorian era. The flour that was used to make cake at that time was usually very coarse and dense, but by adding other ingredients such as cocoa to it, it would be broken down and give the cake a velvety texture, hence the name velvet cake. Red velvet cake specifically uses cocoa, which not only breaks down the flour but also turns the cake red and gives it a chocolatey taste. The recipe has evolved since then, with variations based on the location and the time period. For instance, recipes from the southern United States often include buttermilk, and recipes from the World War II era often substituted in beet juice due to food rationing. Although the Waldorf Astoria Hotel has at times served red velvet cake, there's no evidence of a special recipe being sold for $350, or of the hotel being the first ones to come up with the idea. This is in fact a variation on a common urban legend in which a recipe is sold for a ridiculous amount of money, and the person who inadvertently paid that much for it gets revenge by distributing it freely. Another more recent variant involves a $250 recipe for chocolate chip cookies from Neiman Marcus. If you search for Neiman Marcus cookie online, you can find dozens of recipes claiming to be the $250 one. However, according to popular fact check website Snopes, the story is completely false. Not only does Neiman Marcus make their recipes available for free to anyone who wants them, they did not serve chocolate chip cookies until after the story started spreading. In fact, they added chocolate chip cookies to their menu in response to it. Not all stories are so easy to fact check, though. For instance, the vanishing hitchhiker stories that I discussed in my last video are a little bit more subjective and mostly depend on your belief in ghosts. They're often rooted in real-world locations and may even reference specific streets or intersections where the driver supposedly picked up the ghost. But the ghost is rarely given a name, even in versions where the driver eventually visits their grave. And when there is a name, it's something very generic, like Mary, that could apply to any number of women. So really, it's all up to the listener to decide whether the story sounds plausible or not. I don't know about you, but personally, I would be very skeptical of anybody who claimed to have given a ride to a hitchhiking ghost. On the other hand, sometimes there will be very specific details in a story that can help to confirm it as true or false. Take, for instance, this urban legend about a woman who was allegedly bitten by a snake while shopping at a discount store in Texas. I'd like some information, a male caller told the Dallas City News Desk some weeks ago. It seems he'd heard about a woman who had gone to a local discount store to look at some fur coats imported from Mexico. When the woman put her hand in the coat pocket, she felt a sudden sharp pain. A few minutes later, her arm supposedly had started turning black and blue. Well, the man continued, they rushed her to the hospital. It seems that pain was a snake in the coat pocket. The woman's arm had to be amputated. The reporter said he'd check the story. About that time, a woman called with the same story, only she'd heard the woman died right in Presbyterian Hospital's emergency ward. Presbyterian Hospital said it had no such case in record. My brother is a doctor, another caller explained. He's on the staff at Baylor Hospital and he was present when they brought the woman in. Baylor Hospital said it also had no such case on record. Neither did the police or the health department. The doctor was questioned. He said it wasn't actually he who was present, but a friend. The friend explained he wasn't present either. He had just overheard two nurses talking about it. After about 10 calls from other interested persons, the fur coat turned into some material that had come in from India. A man gave the name of the insurance company which was handling the case. The insurance man said it wasn't actually his company, but his next door neighbor's cousin's company. 
The managers of the two discount stores most frequently mentioned in the rumor said the story is one that has been traveling across the country. Both noted that neither store even sells fur coats. So as you can see, each person who told this story believed that they were only one or two steps removed from the actual incident. However, no matter how far the reporter traced it back, he could never find the people that it actually had happened to, because it turned out it hadn't happened at all. This story was one that was spread by word of mouth, but the same principle absolutely applies to social media. Just because somebody told a story on Facebook or Twitter doesn't mean that it's true. If the story is something that would be newsworthy, try going to a reputable news source and finding out what their coverage of it is. It's possible the version posted on social media is accurate, but it's also possible that the person who posted it misunderstood or misrepresented what was going on. Maybe they saw a misleading headline. Maybe they're creating a straw man argument. I'd recommend reserving judgment until you've investigated for yourself. One cool trick is called triangulation, which basically just means don't limit yourself to only one source of news. If you can find something in at least three reputable news outlets, it's far more likely to be true. And comparing their coverage of the event can help to identify bias or spin that might distort one particular source's reporting. Not finding it anywhere? Try a fact check website to see if it's a known hoax, urban legend, or otherwise just not true. Another thing that leads to misinformation on the internet is lack of context. Often you'll see either a screenshot or an excerpt that's been reposted on social media, or maybe you'll do a Google search and Google will pull out an excerpt from a website for you, but it's not in its original context. And it can be very helpful to track down the original context, or in the case of a Google search, just click through to it to see what was originally said and whether the short excerpt that you saw is an accurate representation of it. For instance, cycling back around to urban legends, have you ever heard that if you're a college student and you get hit by a university bus, you get free tuition? I remember hearing that when I was a freshman, and even at the time I thought it sounded a little bit suspicious. Let's try googling what happens if you get hit by a university bus. Oh look, Google has pulled out an excerpt from Wikipedia for us. Pass by catastrophe. If a university burns down or is destroyed otherwise, all current students immediately graduate with a bachelor's degree. A student who gets hit by a campus shuttle bus will receive free tuition. So is that our answer? Not so fast. There are a couple of problems here. First of all, this is from Wikipedia, not a specific college or university's website. That means the information is going to be very broad and may not apply to the policies of any particular school. Secondly, it's completely out of context. It's two sentences out of what's presumably a much longer article. So let's click through to the article and see what it says. Oh look, Pass by Catastrophe is an academic urban legend. So urban legend meaning that it's not true. Further down on the page, those two sentences that were in the excerpt on the Google search are actually given as examples of the urban legend and the different forms that it takes. So the article isn't saying that those are true at all. It's giving them as examples of something that isn't true. This is a perfect example of why it is so important if you're dealing with screenshots or excerpts on the internet to find the original web page and find out what it actually says. And really that goes for anything on or offline. Context is everything. What I'm getting at here is that misinformation and disinformation are not purely a modern internet problem, but the rise of the internet and social media have definitely proliferated an age-old tendency that people have to believe things that have no basis in fact. From made up inspirational stories on LinkedIn, to misrepresentations of the news on Facebook or Twitter, to rumors about $250 cookie recipes, there's a lot out there that's just not true. But luckily there are a lot of strategies that you can use to make sure that you don't fall prey to a scam or end up accidentally passing on information that isn't true. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you liked it and you want to see more from me, be sure to subscribe. I'm actually not going to be posting videos over the next month or so, but I'll be back in August and I hope to see you then.